So, <clears throat> this time it's going to be even tougher, unfortunately, because we have four of you excellent candidates giving up a Sunday afternoon in magnificent <clears throat> July. So the first question will be, uh, why is it important that you be elected this year to be Vermont's Lieutenant Governor? Why don't we start with you, Patricia? Great. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Don and to the Orange County Democratic Committee and to all of you for being here on this very hot day. Um, I, I'm the right candidate right now for many reasons, but I want to first start by introducing myself a little bit to you. I grew up on a fourth generation dairy farm here in Orange County, and I was instilled with a deep respect of the land, our communities, and the work ethic that built this state. I'm also a product of our public school system. I went to the Little Red Schoolhouse just down the road, like my grandparents, father, and sisters before me. And I'm deeply aware that Vermont is at a critical turning point. And we need leadership in Montpelier now that understands how to address these issues and engage future generations so that we can all thrive. For almost a decade, I've been the president of the Vermont Council on World Affairs, a statewide organization. And in this role, I have built coalitions across the state. And I have been able to address affordable housing and uh, look at stable costs. Is, is, that, is that time up or is it time almost up? <laughs> Okay, so I'll leave it on together. I believe that we can build a future that protects our quality of life with stable costs and affordable housing where women have equal rights and Vermont remains at the forefront of climate action. And as Lieutenant Governor, I will bring new energy to Montpelier. Now is the time for the era of new leadership that will deliver the results for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Preston. Kitty told. Thank you, Don, and thank you to the Orange County Democrats for having us today and for all of you attending. I am Kitty Toll. I uh, grew up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont in Danville on our dairy farm as well. And I'm really proud to say that the farm is still in existence and the farmhouse has the seventh generation of children in it. And I really look forward to that continuing. I was a public school teacher in the Northeast Kingdom in the towns of Charleston and Gilman, if you've ever been to Gilman, and also in St. Johnsbury. I served in the legislature for 12 years. My first term, I served on the Ag Committee, which was very important because I feel agriculture is the very foundation of this state. My last 10 years, I served on appropriations. In the last four, I was chair of the Appropriations Committee. The Office of Lieutenant Governor, I would bring strong budgeting skills, and with my advocacy, I know that I just can't talk about those, you know, the areas that are so important to me. How do we fund them? How do we make them sustainable? And it's this work that I would bring to the Office of Lieutenant Governor. I built strong coalitions, my budgets went out on unanimous votes from committee, and I know it's important to compromise and work across the aisle. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Dr. David Zuckerman. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. And I want to say there was a sentence in an email we got in preparing for this debate uh, that said, why would you want to squander a summer pushing for votes when you could be pickling cucumbers and going to the state parks? And the reason why me right now is because while I actually do harvest vegetables pretty regularly, uh, I'm thinking about the thousands and thousands of Vermonters that barely even get to go to state parks because they're working 60 hours a week to pay their bills. I'm thinking about uh, my daughter who asked me to run, even though she knew what it would mean as a sacrifice for our family, because our planet is on fire. The reason that I would like you to think that I'm the most uh, preferential candidate is because I have a sense of urgency, as you've seen with the work I've done in the past as well, with respect to the climate, economic injustice, and social injustice, and I have the experience of having been Lieutenant Governor to where I can hit the ground day one and work with Vermonters across the state as I have for years to tackle these issues with the legislature. Thank you. Charlie Kimball. Yes, thank you for that question and thank you for uh, coming out today. Uh, unlike my opponents, I'm not in agriculture. I was born and raised on Molly Gray's dairy farm. <laughs> um, uh, you also said it'd be funny. Yes. <laughs> so, no, um, I think at this time, um, based on the experience that I have, it's a lot more broad than my opponents in this race. I was actually raised in St. Albans, 
uh, and have lived all over the state, including in Brownsville and Woodstock and Dumpston. Uh, and I've worked in the private sector for 25 years with a lot of experience working for businesses large and small. Uh, and I've been in local, in, in local and state government for as long as I can remember. Uh, and I've been in the legislature for the past six years. I'm still in that legislature now and dealing with the crisis of the COVID uh, crisis that we've been dealing with in the legislature. I've got very recent, real experience dealing with that. And I think that really qualifies me uh, in terms of being lieutenant governor and bringing people together to say, how can we recover from this pandemic? Because we are certainly not out of it now. So there's a lot more that we need to do and I'm prepared to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie Kimball. Uh, Dick McCormick, Senator from Windsor County, has joined us. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> what life experience or event was most influential to who you are, the work you do, and your motivation to make the world better? Charlie, let's start with you. What singular life event? Um, so many. So I'm the youngest of eight kids, so there's a lot of uh, experience and learning in the hands of your brothers and sisters. Uh, so I would say it's probably um, the tutelage I gained from one of my oldest brothers and taking me to the ski area for early training, but shoving me in the back of a VW Volkswagen Bug uh, while his other four buddies were in the car. I mean, I, I say that just because uh, there's a commitment that brothers and sisters show to one another uh, and then you really just have to kind of roll with the punches a little bit. So that's, my personality is really to listen, uh, to adapt to the situation, uh, and to use that information that I get when asking questions to make decisions. So that's enabled me really to be a moderate uh, and to consider issues and consider our opinions from both sides of the aisle. Uh, and that has, for me, been very formative in what I've done in politics and what I've done in life. Thank you. Thanks. David? Uh, well, I guess as a singular experience, it would be the death of my father when I was just 13. Um, but to go beyond that, it was the 13 years I had with him. Um, I used to go to the hospital with him regularly, and when he was visiting his patients after surgeries on the weekend, and see how he cared for people, and took time with them as a doctor who had more than six minutes per patient. Um, when I went to the stores with him, and he would talk with random strangers in the aisles, and a trip to get butter would take an hour, learning the gift of gab, which happens to be particularly good in politics. Um, and as a Jew, knowing that he stood up for the KKK's right to march in Skokie, Illinois, um, because of the right to speak, free speech, and that we have to be able to have the conversations and not shut anyone down. Um, so there's a, a lot of other things to that. Thanks, Kitty. Uh, thank you for that question. I really think it has to be the experience my mother allowed me to have by going to work with her. Um, and working with her often was on the farm, but she was a legislator and I was only five, there was no kindergarten, and I quite often went to the state house with my mother for the one year she was in for the redistricting in 1965. Uh, what she taught me, uh, she planted the seed first of, of politics. But she also taught me that there were struggles with women in Vermont moving forward in politics. There has been no other female legislator from my district between my mother when she ran in 65 and when I ran in 2008. And there was only one other Democrat during that time. And she showed me that perseverance, uh, being independent, speaking your voice, and being taken seriously um, was key, and um, those are the things that I think have certainly crafted the person that I am today. Moderator's prerogative. Tell us, <coughs> tell us your mom's name. Uh, my mother's name was Catherine Beatty, and uh, she was a real force of a real force of nature. We had role reversal in our home before there was even the term. She she ran the farm. She did taxes. She was in charge. Made pies. And pies. <laughs> Thank you. If I had to choose one singular moment, it would actually be watching my grandfather, Warren Preston, who some people in this room may know. He's a farmer here in Orange County. And I would go to town meeting days with him starting at five years old, and he was classically known for, at the end of a lot of discussion, putting one hand down, the other hand down, taking the slow stand, <clears throat> and walking to the podium, <clears throat> and having the most prolific words. 
advocating for the agricultural community. <clears throat> Excuse me. That would be if I had to pick one moment. After that time, I spent my, the next several years, I've, I've lived in or worked in over 45 countries, and I've worked with minority groups and disenfranchised and minor, uh, marginalized people. And each time I've traveled and worked within a different group and setting, I've been deeply impacted. And that has also affected the work. Once I came home and returned to the Vermont and worked as the president of the Vermont Council on World Affairs, traveling to every corner of this state, meeting with Vermonters and understanding how, you know, there's beauty and success, but there is struggle in this state. And I'm deeply impacted by that every single time I travel around this state and meet with Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. <clears throat> John Nance Gardner was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first vice president. And he famously said, the vice presidency isn't worth a warm bucket of spit. Many believe the same holds true for Lieutenant Governor. Convince us otherwise. If you argue that it's a bully pulpit, give an example of a former Vermont Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> achieving an important public policy win by using this alleged bully pulpit. Let's start with you, Kitty. Kitty. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm running for this office because it is an office and it's an important office. And I believe that I can bring more purpose to this office, especially with the, my budget experience and also with the relationships that I have uh, made in Montpelier. Um, knowing that you could be governor in no time, as what happened with Howard Dean when, when Governor Snelling died, this is a very important office that you are prepared to step in and run the state if it is needed. Howard Dean was able to do that and he also made great purpose out of that office. But the person that I do want to highlight is Madeline Cunin when she was um, uh, Lieutenant Governor of the state of Vermont. She was the trailblazer for women. She was the voice for women and she created the path for us. She never had a quiet office holder, uh, whether she was in uh, the House of Representatives, or when she was governor, or when she was lieutenant governor, or when she was an ambassador. And we could always count on that strong voice to help women move forward. Thanks. Patricia? Yeah, thank you. So, um, could you repeat the question just one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, oh, 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 actually, no, no, I remember. Okay. So, so, there are two primary roles to the office of lieutenant governor. I'm sure many of you seen in this room know that. One is to preside over the Senate, and the other is to step in if need be for the governor. When it comes to stepping in for the governor, I have led an organization in this state for 10 years where I have increased the budget by 130%. I've allocated federal funding very effectively. And on the other side, presiding over the Senate, breaking a tie, supporting the senator, senators and passing legislation, of course, is very important. Outside of that, the real question is, and then what? What do you do? What's the rest? I see myself as uniquely qualified for this position because what I think the rest of this office can be is exactly what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I've been mobilizing communities around the state, I've been elevating the voices of Vermonters, and I've been bringing people together using civil discourse as a tool to consensus build and move forward in progress. I would use that, I would use these skills that I've built over the last 10 years and, and apply them to the office of the Lieutenant Governor. Thanks, David. Well, a couple things I will say, as Lieutenant Governor, some of the work I did I will describe and I would continue to do that with even more vigor. And in particular what that work was, besides presiding over the Senate and being prepared to be Governor, is one, you're also on the Committee on Committees, which controls the committee assignments. And with the climate being a paramount issue of our day, one of the areas I'd really like to look at is the Senate Transportation Committee, considering 40% of our energy, uh, fossil fuel energy, is through transportation. And we've historically sort of used that committee as a, as a traditional paving kind of committee. And I think we need a little more energy, a lot more energy, looking at climate issues on the Transportation Committee. Secondly, uh, the way I used the office most was traveling the state, much as I did as a legislator, building constituent support all over the state to help the legislature be more forward-thinking on policy. Uh, and I can give an example. When I first got to the Lieutenant Governor's office in 2016, I emailed newsletters out regularly. The first email I sent out was about some issues and said, your voice matters, contact your senator. And within one day of my sending that letter out, 
three senators came to my office and said, so I hear you're asking people to give us phone calls. Now, it wasn't given with the most loving presentation, but it meant folks were gonna listen to what I had to say and work to influence the process, which is what I think we need, more Vermonters in the process. Great, thanks. Charlie, give us some more humor, <laughs> if I can. Uh, when I decided to run for lieutenant governor, it was really to take one issue that I've been working on in the legislature for the last six years, and that's on workforce development. Uh, this is an area of focus that I've been working on in my committee in the, in the legislature, uh, and often falls in between different agencies and departments and nonprofit organizations in the state. So I want to use the Office of Lieutenant Governor to really bring that kind of focus across the state, to say how can we make meaningful careers for individuals that not only sustains them, but also fulfills them. So that's really my, my main issue. Uh, but you can do that as Lieutenant Governor because you have a statewide office and people actually return your phone calls. And you can try to shape the policy and government uh, between what the executive branch is doing, what the legislative branch is doing, and then what those institutions are doing. So that's how I really envision using it. Then. You asked about a particular person. I'll just refer to Brian Doobie when he was lieutenant governor that took it on as to be an ambassador for the state. He focused on the aerospace industry and how could to strengthen that across the state for the businesses that are involved in that particular industry. So working as an arm, as a mouthpiece, not an arm piece, not a mouthpiece, uh, hopefully that was funny, a mouthpiece for the state government to really try to build that industry, and I think he did a good job. Thanks. David, tell us about one person who taught you leadership. 30 seconds. Well, I think I'll name my other parent, my mom, who was on the school board for 18 years and was chair of the school board. And, um, I, I learned both good things and bad things from her leadership because in part when she would walk in a room people were a little nervous because she took over. Um, she also got a lot of good things done. Uh, so I learned having a sense of force and passion for what you're fighting for is important. Um, but frankly I thought I had a very good balance between uh, the alpha mom and the beta dad, similar to your household, uh, with respect to um, that comfort and that listening and that understanding that you need to also bring into the conversation. Thanks, Kitty. Um, I would really have to think about this, and I think I would go to my high school science teacher, Mrs. Rosa, who was, uh, a teacher has to be a leader in a classroom, but they also have to bring the classroom along with them in order to have a successful learning experience. And she was able to do that. I, I remember her teaching style being very unique, and it was more hands-on lots more conversation and in, in all that she taught us a lot of science and I can remember dissecting frogs which was just awful um, but but she also taught us how to communicate and she taught us life skills that were so important and so she had to have incredible leadership skills to to do that with her students. Thanks. Charlie? Uh, for me fairly recently it would be Paul Costello Council on Rural Development because it really emphasized how to become a servant leader. And really, it's not about you, it's about what the organization is able to accomplish. And I've really embraced that. And he always thought that the most influential person was the clerk. Um, and if the clerk is actually doing a great job, you can get a lot done. So it's the person that not is looking for the headlines, but is getting the work done. So I'd say Paul. And another person, detail oriented, a guy named David Chaffee, who was the founder of Cover Bridges Half Marathon. I took over the race to organize it, and you said, just don't forget the details. Patricia? It's not just one singular person. It is my father who taught me about hard work on the farm. It is Mrs. Patrika in the kindergarten class at the Little Red Schoolhouse. It is my current staff and team at the Vermont Council on World Affairs. It is every teacher I have ever had. It is the other candidates on this stage. I am constantly inspired by people that I'm interacting with in my life and learning from them and growing from them. And I think that's an important piece of life and looking to mentors and other leaders in your life is to, to, to accept them from all places and all people. Thanks. What is Vermont's biggest threat? One minute, Billy. Biggest threat and biggest opportunity. Let's start with you, Charlie. The biggest threat, Vermont's biggest threat, I think. Yeah, biggest threat for Vermont and biggest opportunity for Vermont. How long do I have? <laughs> one minute. Okay. Less than that, yeah. Um, I would say if there was one thing we could address in the state of Vermont, it is the lack of affordable housing uh, for people, to, for working families. Um, and that is the biggest threat because we are having people move out because they can't afford a place to live. 
Uh, we have people that can't go to work um, and just sustain themselves based on the salary they can earn and the cost of housing. So I think that is the greatest threat. We have an opportunity to use a lot of the funds we've already allocated through uh, federal funds, through ARPA and CARES Act money. Uh, and that, that money is going to be put to work over the next five years. You can see a lot of new housing projects, a lot of new housing units throughout the state. That's our biggest opportunity. It's also the biggest threat. Thank you. David? Uh, I would say the climate crisis. Uh, I'm talking to a lot of farmers who are dry right now. Um, I'm looking at a change in our um, sugaring season. I'm looking at a change in our skiing season. Um, so from a life perspective, from an economy perspective, things that we rely on in the state, um, without a, a healthy planet to live on and a healthy landscape to be on, nothing else is going to actually matter. Um, so how long are we looking? Yes, short term, housing, uh, you know, job training, people to fill the technical jobs we need. But the hill is so much bigger when it comes to climate. And opportunity, I think, um, in some ways, broadband helps a lot with opportunity uh, with respect to allowing people to not have to drive as far for work, allowing people to make a better income in place uh, and rebuild our rural communities so we can have uh, a more focused village centers and town centers, which is also a better climate way of life. Patricia? Yeah, we are facing a lot of crises in this state. It's actually quite hard to pick one. And I think that one that, that strikes me is affordability because it touches on many of these things. One is the affordability of housing, the affordability of childcare, the gas prices that are rising, it's untenable. And I think that all, you know, all these issues are intersectional and will only be exacerbated by the climate crisis as well. Uh, you know, when I think about getting people back into the workforce, I think about how women were disproportionately impacted during COVID-19 and taken out of the women's workforce and not able to re-enter. Um, so we have a lot on our hands to, to take care of all of this. And I think that an opportunity point is having some fresh perspectives in Montpelier. We're going to have over one third of the legislature turning over this year. And I think having new voices as a part of this conversation is going to help everything. Thank you, Kitty. I would say an economic crisis because I really see the economy propped up uh, by three legs on a stool, uh, housing, broadband, and childcare. And you really can't improve the Vermont, um, the Vermont economy without addressing all three. And, and what we have been doing is limping along and patching where we can because we've been in a recession since, uh, for, for the time that I was in the legislature in 2008 until the pandemic came, we were really working our way through the recession. And at this time, we really have to look at how we're going to fund childcare. And I think that could set us apart from all other states. We have to have broadband in every corner to keep Vermonters here, young families here, and to attract and keep businesses here. And um, housing, housing is uh, an issue and we need to look at more downtown walkable areas for housing and regenerating and rejuvenating uh, historic buildings in our downtowns and creating more cluster housing to protect our environment. And uh, the, the climate crisis is, is all, you know, all depends on the actions that we take in all areas of our economy. And we have to address the climate crisis. A yes or no question, an interesting one. <clears throat> Do you consider war, W-A-R, war, to be a Vermont State business? We lost more National Guardsmen in Iraq than any other state. <clears throat> Patricia. I can only say yes or no. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. You can embellish it. <laughs> I mean, I think that if, if we're going to have to go to war and it's a federal decision, Vermont is, plays a role in that and we are part of the discussion. And we, so, so yes, um, it doesn't mean that I think that we should respond to every single thing. And I think that there's a, it's a much bigger conversation. But yes, I think we're a part of that conversation. Thank you. Kitty. I never want to look at war as a business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just see it as a, a conflict and, and where the United States has to play such a, a pivotal role as we see what's happening in Ukraine, but we should never look at it as a business. Mm -hmm. Charlie? Uh, no. Um, Vermont has given great sacrifices more uh, by population died in the Civil War than any other state, and we've given a lot in treasure and blood. 
Um, but we cannot make those decisions lightly. David. Uh, no, for many of the reasons stated, but I will also say that I was an outspoken, uh, I think probably the most outspoken politician in the state uh, against the F-35s, which is fundamentally a part of the war machine and the war economy. And uh, if we're truly going to move away from war as a part of our economy, then we have to be honest about it in our own backyard as well. Thank you. The asker of this question asked me to bring it back for this round. Yes or no, do you support a Vermont constitutional amendment that gives the earth, that gives the earth rights? It would be trees, woods, and rivers, so on. David? Uh, given that we failed to do it on our own, I think we should, yes. Charlie? I would say no. Uh, we are definitely stewards of the environment, stewards of the land, but uh, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Patricia? Yeah, I think I'd have to understand it a little bit better, what it would mean and what it would entail, to be honest. I'd be open to the idea, but, but my gut instinct is to say no. I think we just have to be better stewards and do a better job of taking care of the earth and its land. And it's our responsibility, what we're, what we're doing to this land. Thanks. Kitty? I would certainly be open to it, but with any major policy decision, um, it's, it's much more complicated than a yes or no answer, and that's when you bring all the information to the table and really make an informed decision. Thanks. Uh, Billy, 30 seconds. Um, David, renewable energy is most easily accessed by the elites as we transition to clean energy. How do we best protect low and moderate income customers? Well, I really appreciate this question because as a candidate who in the past has been probably most maligned by the fact that I'll talk about taxes and the fact that since Reaganomics and neoliberalism, the wealthiest have paid less and less taxes and certainly people have paid more because of progressive taxation. I would say that we need to talk about progressive taxation to come up with the resources for weatherization for incentivizing solar and wind for everyday people, for uh, helping everyday folks with getting renewable energy vehicles when uh, right now it is still primarily a middle and upper middle class uh, privilege. Thanks. Katie? Uh, thank you. And uh, I do agree with David, and I think that the uh, Vermont government. Uh, the Vermont legislature needs to continue with incentives and they are targeted at, at the lower income individuals in Vermont for uh, purchasing new or now uh, pre-owned electric vehicles and making charging stations more available and weatherization activities. And on top of what Vermont is doing, communities are also helping with, with, with these activities for people who cannot afford them. Uh, we, we need to continue with more incentives uh, to, to to get as many electric vehicles on the road and to weatherize as many homes as we can, which we now have 80 million in the budget to do. Patricia. Yeah, so Vermont has committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by 26% by 2030. And this is critical, especially because climate change impacts disproportionately BIPOC and low-income communities. And we can do this through, as uh, two others have now just said on the stage, through incentives. And I think those need to be toward weatherizing the 90,000 homes needed to meet this goal. It's toward the 112,000 additional heat pumps the state needs. And it's through more uh, EV friendly cars. And so I would support all of those initiatives and, and making them accessible to all Vermonters. Thanks, Charlie. Well, thank you. I, uh, you might not be surprised. I think it comes down to workforce. Uh, weatherization, we have this goal of 90,000 homes, but our current rate is 1,500 homes per year. So it's only going to take 60 years to reach that goal. So we really need to invest in a workforce that can do the work necessary uh, to really weatherize homes and make it meaningful. A second thing that we talk about is just a source of funds. A fuel efficiency tax might be the right thing to do. We already have an, an electrical efficiency tax. Uh, to really help to provide some of the heat, the transfer of different heat sources used, uh, getting away from fossil fuels. We do have a lot of federal money that's in there, but that's, thank you for the red flag. Thanks. Thanks. Can you do it's this? Only pops. It really is. They're great lollipops. Can you do this in 30 seconds? Brag about an issue, win, or public policy success that you led to fruition? Brag about something that you led 
charge on that was a winner, that won? Kitty. Uh, sure. While I was serving as the uh, chair of appropriations, um, the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, there was a decision about how to get that to the floor. And the committee had worked, the, the energy committee had worked on the bill, but the bill set came to appropriations. And I moved that bill through appropriations and got it to the floor ahead of the budget, was, which was very unusual. You usually do not pass a major bill with an appropriation way ahead of the budget because it sets it as a priority. And I moved that bill early on, and fortunately I did, because I did not know a pandemic was coming, which, which really could have complicated the passage of that bill. But I'm very proud of the fact of moving that as a priority. Thanks. Patricia? Well, it's no secret that um, I am coming in from the outside on politics. So I don't have a specific uh, piece of legislation I've moved forward, but I do have an incredible amount of background and experience in advocating and working for Vermonters. Mm -hmm. And I've done this on topics such as climate action, workforce, every topic and issue that faces the state, I've addressed it. One that I'm particularly proud of is looking at our, our refugee and our refugee crisis. Uh, when everything happened in Ukraine, we were one of the first organizations to address it by pulling together a day-long uh, event that focused on the history, how we got here, how it impacts Vermonters. And we brought in the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine to discuss this issue with Vermonters so that we become a more hospitable state to welcome refugees and asylees coming here to be a part of our workforce. Thank you. Charlie? I'd say there's uh, two from this very recent session because I'm still in the state legislature. Uh, one is we, we brought together from the Rural Caucus a Rural Economic Development Omnibus Bill. It had several different components and it worked its way into a number, a number of different bills. Uh, some is looking at the forest products industry and how to make it easier to do business there. Uh, some is about the future of the forest products industry and having uh, putting together a strategic plan. Some of my colleagues here uh, were part of that. Uh, and the second is just a, a, a really large economic recovery and workforce development package we did this year, uh, allocating a substantial amount of money in new programs to really address some of the underlying economic issues and workforce development issues. Thanks. David? It's a really hard question for me because I was fortunate enough to stick my neck out on a few issues for many years. I spent 14 years getting our GMO legislation passed. I was the lead sponsor on medical aid and dying. It took us nine years and one of the most impactful moments that I've had in all the years is when a family comes to me and thanks me for my work on that because they were with their loved one when they were in control of the end of their life. And I introduced marriage equality in 2005 before other people were ready to do so. And uh, it was a tie-breaking for the 100th vote to override Governor Douglas's veto on marriage equality. And uh, so those two bills, as far as the individual impact on people's lives, uh, are most impactful. That's great. Charlie, let's start with you. There, these are going to be four rapid-fire questions, okay. interesting ones. Bernie Sanders is the most destructive force in the Democratic Party. <clears throat> this is a question from a Republican. The most what force? Destructive. Charlie. That sounds rhetorical. Um, so is the question... I'm sorry. It, it, yes, I'm sorry. I, it, that really didn't belong in this lightning round. Let, let's save that for a moment. <laughs> All right. If if Biden were not to run for re-election, President Biden, whom we, would you prefer? If multiple choice, or is it we have to come up, Charlie? If uh, Joe Biden was not to run for re-election, who would you like to run instead? Yes. Wow. Uh, well, as running for lieutenant governor, I haven't put a lot of thought into that, to be honest with you. But uh, I would look to the rank of the Democratic Party, um, to the um, the bench of the Democratic Party. So I'd look to his vice president. Good. David? Elizabeth Warren. Kitty? I would look toward Pete Buttigieg and also to the governor of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Kamala Harris, I think that she has um, been in a, uh, yeah, Kamala Harris. I, I missed who you said. Kamala Harris. Thank you. Um, divestment from fossil fuels. Does any of you not support the Vermont State Pension Funds and Teacher Retirement Funds being <coughs> divested from fossil fuels? Do any of you 
I you know, sort of a double negative question, but I think the answer is no, I don't <laughs> go against their getting rid of fossil fuels, if that makes any sense. To completely confuse raise, your, raise your hand if you're in favor of divesting from fossil fuels. I think that's easier. So I'd put a qualifier. All right. I mean, because it's the Vermont Pension Investment Committee that actually makes that decision. Uh, so they have an obligation to make that decision on behalf of the retiree. So if you're looking for it, would you be in favor of it? Yes, if it aligns with what they're trying to achieve for the pensioners, uh, because they have to make that tough decision every time. And may I put a qualifier on? I'd like to put a qualifier on as yes, well. Yes, you may. Of course we want to move in that direction, but I also think that we need to have the guidance and leadership of the state treasurer. Um, that, that comes to, um, you know, Mike Pichek, it will probably be our new state treasurer because there's think he nobody, running against, him. nobody <laughs> running against him. And, and, and so I think in fairness, I would like to hear from Mike Pichek. Anyone else want to water this one down? <laughs> Can I raise my hand on both other mics? <laughs> Patricia. No, no, I'm just saying I agree. All right. But my answer is yes, I want them to. That doesn't mean I have the power to make them, as Charlie yeah. said. So the answer is still yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, we got it. Everybody got it. I'm happy with that. Uh, when are you planning to get your electric vehicle, Charlie? Uh, well, I've been looking at the Ford F-150 Lightning, uh, but it's just, I don't have it. Um, and I'm actually going to be buying my son's pickup truck because he's moving to New York City. So probably in two years, because that's when that truck will be uh, not viable. Thanks, David. Uh, well, I made the decision to invest in 64 solar panels for cooling vegetables on the farm, so I was limited in where I could put the resources. Uh, but I would like to sell uh, one of our vehicles and get an electric vehicle. It's also about a year or two wait to get one. Thanks. Kitty? It's a little bit like the cobbler's son. Um, I, I am in a family that owns car dealerships, and they are sold to customers. And if I were to have one and a customer wanted it, it goes to the customer. And we know you can't get one right now, so I do not have one. Wow, interesting. I mean, what, what, a, what a privilege to be able to say now. <laughs> I mean, I, I talk about it with my husband all of the time, but we can't afford that. <laughs> we can't afford that like many Vermonters can't afford that. And so um, I think that the more important question is, what are we going to do as a state to make that affordable? When do you think climate migration will begin to occur? One minute, and in what ways do you think it will change Vermont? What effect will climate migration, is it gonna happen when, and how will it change Vermont? David. I would say it already has. Uh, at the farmer's market in Burlington this summer, I have been blown away at the number of new Vermonters, and they're coming here for three reasons. Uh, number one is climate. Uh, I've met many people from Florida, Texas, Arizona, and Mississippi, you just say it's too damn hot down there. Uh, they're worried about the winter, but too hot. Two is democracy uh, in general with respect to, do I need to say more? Three um, had to do with how well we did with COVID, and they look at Vermont as a, a reasonable and sane place where people who do have different opinions seem to still come together, relatively speaking, uh, compared to everywhere else in the country. But the migration is now, it's happening, and it's going to accelerate. Thanks, Kitty. Thank you. This is a great question. I've been riding across the state meeting uh, people, and I've talked to several realtors, and as David said, it is happening now. Uh, people are coming to Vermont, buying pieces of land. Some are moving here, some are buying them and renting out properties, and some are leaving them dark, and it's their security for when they want to leave their area, and it's really putting pressure on our housing crisis. So we have climate refugees already in this state. Uh, there was a recent study and several of Vermont's counties made it in the top 10 places to live in the country with Lamoille County being the best pace, place to live when you're considering uh, the climate crisis. And um, people across the country, they don't have water, Vermont has water. We don't have fires like across the country and we do not have the continuing storms. Uh, people are going to flock here and we must plan for it. Charlie? Yeah, absolutely, the climate refugees are here. Uh, and what's happened is that a lot of them have been able to bring their jobs from away, uh, where they're earning substantially more than the average Vermonter is earning. Uh, so that's increased our housing prices, our rent prices, shortage on those availabilities. 
So we've had that issue happen. Uh, we have to look for longer term solutions for housing, shared equity propositions, shared equity structures, um, which are now happening throughout Vermont, but we need to expand that to make sure that housing stays affordable. So it is happening now. Broadband and remote work is wonderful, except that it means that we do have a lot of folks that their income is not tied to what they're doing in state. Uh, and I can speak to that because family members are in that boat right now. Uh, and they're able to afford the place that they want to call home, but they're doing it with their salaries that they're bringing from out of state. So it is definitely impacting us now. We would welcome, we need to welcome these people, say, great to have you here, love you, pay your taxes. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Patricia? Yeah, like my fellow candidates have said, it's, it's not if it will happen, it's they're here. They're here and they're continuing to come and it's not going to stop. And it's going to impact the state in a, the number of ways that all of my, my fellow candidates have addressed here today. So, you know, as it was just said, housing, of course, we're in a crisis and it's only going to be exacerbated. So the real question is, we have this window and a moment and an opportunity to say, people are coming, they're on their way, but how do we prepare for this? And for me, that's how we're investing our dollars right now. That's on addressing the housing crisis and that's on addressing our infrastructure issues as well as wastewater and sewer. And we need to be prepared. We need to have our cities and towns ready to welcome the arrival of these people that are not only here, but more coming. Great. Kitty, can you think of three or four core values, one minute, uh, you believe are essential to leading a fulfilling life. Three or four values that you really hold high and dear. I would say the number one is kindness. Uh, we do not see enough kindness in this world. Uh, growing up on a family farm, I'd say hard work, you know, and, and enjoy your work. So hard working, kindness. Um, Having a respect for others. We don't always all agree, but we need to respect one another and work out our differences. So kindness, hard work, respect, and um, joy. If you don't find joy in life, you're probably bringing others down with you and very critical. So I would say joy. Patricia? Integrity, inclusivity, and empathy. Those are the three. And I think to be a good leader, empathy is the most important. It's why I want to be a leader, and it's why I want to be our next lieutenant governor. Thank you. Charlie? I've thought about it a lot. I, I would say be kind, be generous, and live with intent. Uh, make sure that you, you are doing what motivates you, what gives you joy, but to live with intent, not to just float. Thanks. David? Um, compassion uh, for everybody around us in the different circumstances we're all in. Justice, grace for people, we all make mistakes, and resiliency. I missed the third one. Grace. Giving, giving grace, uh, grace to individuals as we all make mistakes. We all live in the last houses at some point. What wonderful answers, thank you. Um, What's the hardest question you've been asked on the campaign, and how would you answer it? Okay. Well, the one that I've gotten the most difficult response from was, what party are you running in? Uh, and that was in St. Albans at a parade, and when I said, I'm running the Democratic Party, um, the gentleman did not like my response, and responded how there was the ruin of the nation and everything else. Uh, so it's, it wasn't a difficult question to answer, it was a difficult question to deal with. Um, so it's, in, in that moment, it just tried to listen. Um, and why, what was, why was he so angry? Um, he had his grandson with him. I thought that might have tempered his enthusiasm a little bit, but it didn't. Um, and just to try to understand where people are uh, is really what I'm trying to do is in my campaign is to find out, all right, you're angry about that. Well, tell me a little bit more and try to get that out in a civil way um, so that it's not just one wall against another. Patricia? Yeah, I think one of the hardest questions I get asked is surrounding the idea that I have to have been a former legislator to be eligible for the office of lieutenant governor and to explain myself around that. And I answer it in that 
I think I'm uniquely qualified, I know that I'm uniquely qualified for this position, and I think that there are many paths to office, and I think there are many qualifications that will make you a good leader, especially in the role of Lieutenant Governor. Um, and and that's, that's it for me. Thanks. Kitty? I think the questions that have been most difficult for me to answer are those that are rooted in misinformation, because no matter what you say, they're not going to see the other side. And so misinformation has created so much of this divide in this country, and uh, there's no longer any conversation. It, you know, you're just wrong. It is, you know, any, if you try to respond, uh, there, there's just no listening or any belief into any other side. So I would say misinformation is, is creating the biggest challenge for our lives, probably. David. I think it comes down to what the definition of the hardest question is, because I've faced a lot of questions over many years running statewide, and they're usually about policy, so I usually have an answer for a lot of those. Um, the hardest question is from friends or others who I've known over the years who ask, why are you doing it again? You've given so much, and the time from your family uh, that it takes to do this. And it's a very hard question, uh, because I'm incredibly torn between the mission of public service that I was in, embedded with by my parents and the urgency of the challenges that we face today um, and the time that it does take away. Like this morning, my daughter asked if I was going to be around on Friday afternoon before she goes back to camp uh, next week for three weeks. And um, that's, that's the hardest one. Thank you. How will you use your unique public position to facilitate awareness and deal with the, with mental health in Vermont? This question comes from a school, from an elementary school educator. Patricia. Yeah, so I'm gonna start by saying how I do it, and it's the raising the awareness piece. So as I've mentioned a few times here today, is that my organization is focused around building an awareness of the world and its people. So I'm uniquely qualified to do that and host educational programs and forums to raise awareness on topics. As far as how and the, the true mechanics, just the other day I was at Jenna's Promise uh, to discuss this exact thing mental health, the opioid addiction, and it was part of a community uh, conversation. And it was one of the most powerful things that I've ever done in my life. And it was bringing people together to talk about addiction, mental health, community issues, and it was a safe space where everyone was able to come together to, to discuss solutions, even when they disagreed, even when they thought that there should be a different way forward. Um, and so for me, I think it's destigmatizing, raising awareness, and then putting funding behind initiatives that support mental health. Thank you. Where are we in the line? Okay. Sure. Um, we have seen the mental, height, uh, the mental health crisis just explode in this state, especially with COVID. Uh, children that have had to stay at home and have not been able to go to school and socialize, parents who have been forced to stay at home, uh, the, the numbers are huge and we're going to see a huge impact on our schools with our, with our school children, especially those that were in the pre-K um, through you know, the early elementary years. That, that just needed that growth and did not experience that growth by having um, a ch uh, school uh, available to them except remotely. It's going to take money, it's going to take best practices. And before you spend money, we have to have best practices and we have to know the right direction to go. We can throw money at a problem, but unless we bring professionals to the table and not politicians, you need professionals that can guide politicians on what programs need to be in place and do more prevention. Prevention is the key. We've got to keep the money here in the crisis that we're in and provide the money uh, for, for prevention and identification activities and bring everybody to the table to help solve this issue. Thank you. David? Well, one area that I tried to work on a few years ago with the governor, uh, which unfortunately didn't work out, was I said to him, we spend our largest budget in government is uh, Department, Department of Health, or Agent of Human Services. And the second largest is education. And they are in silos. In some places, the schools work well with mental health and, and human services, and others, not well at all. 
And I think we really need to tackle those siloing of our state resources because we could both become more efficient with your tax dollars and free up dollars and provide better services with more service providers at the front lines in our schools with our youth, as was said earlier, tackling the issue early on. But all too often we work on a two-year cycle, which is basically a one-year cycle, and we don't do long-term thinking. That's true with the climate, it's true with mental health, it's been true with weatherization. We've had many balanced, but I would say conservative budgets where we do not put enough money. What was it, 1,500 houses a year in weather, weatherization when we've known the goal was 5,000. We need to be willing to raise the revenue to put into these and save money through those agency savings to put into these areas. Charlie. I was talking to you yesterday with the people from Hannah's House, which is doing a lot of mental health work inside the school systems in the Mad River Valley. Uh, and they talk about the stresses that they encounter and, um, and their fundraising goals and their necessity to rely on public giving. And they do incredible work, and there's just the, the admission that there is not going to go away any kind of mental stress. We still have a huge opioid crisis, which you hear about most every day talking to people. Uh, that is an outgrowth somewhat of mental stress as well. So I would say, again, to say it's, it, I'm not okay and you're not okay, but that's okay. Uh, and trying to admit that people with stresses in their life, uh, they're not alone. And to continue to bring that home to people. Uh, we've had mental stress in our own family, uh, and it's not that they're ill, it's nothing you can see, but it's something you have to deal with. Uh, and it's okay. To admit that you've got an issue and that you need help, you need to get help. Thank you. Two final questions and then your closing statements. And you people have been so patient and decent about it. Billy, are they doing okay on time? Okay. What's that? Oh. Well, then cancel it. Give us a final word of hope and uh, closing statement. Hope, H-O-P-E. -E. Give us a little hope in your closing statements. What's that? Charlie, you want to start us off? Oh, sure, me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I really trust Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the threat to democracy, in Vermont we have to remember that we have the most accessible voting system in the country. Uh, and we do have a great depth of experience. We have a great commitment to the principles that make us a strong state. Now, in my closing statement, now, is that? Yeah. Okay, terrific. Great. Now we'll give you a full minute. Thank, Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay. So, but politics today can be very discouraging. I mean, the shouting from the extremes just drowns out the voices in the middle. And that's, that's where the work gets done, is in the middle. And I'm a moderate Democrat working towards those practical and pragmatic solutions to Vermont's biggest issues. I see them as workforce development, housing, child care, and then rural vitality. So unlike my opponents in this race, I'm still in the legislature. I've been working on solutions for that over, through COVID over the past three years, and this year even delivering on a large economic recovery and workforce development package. I think I've worked hard enough to earn your consideration and I hope that on August 9th, you'll vote for Charlie Kimball for Lieutenant Governor, and my information is at charlieforvermont.com. So I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity to meet with you today on a, on a beautiful day. Uh, and it's been great to meet with you. Thank you. David? Well, I'll answer the whole question first, which is that as I've gone around, uh, and in the parades I saw this a lot, the energy and enthusiasm from young people has grown particularly with the Supreme Court decisions, which is the opposite of hope. But the, but the engagement has increased, and the engagement of the rest of us who are older than young people has also increased. And I've seen numbers around the country, particularly in suburban areas, that some vote uh, directions may be shifting more in our direction, because really, the bigger picture ultimately is national. And I've got a little bit of hope there that maybe the court decisions will finally make some change in voting rights. With respect to my closing statement, um, I come to you with the most experience in, in legislative and um, statewide office, and I look forward to returning to the office of Lieutenant Governor because I hear from Vermonters who are feeling so many heavy issues as you are in this room, from the climate 
to the economy, COVID, democracy, uh, lack of child care, it's, it's pretty heavy. Um, I have received the endorsements of every union that has endorsed so far. I have received the endorsement of every environmental organization that has endorsed so far, because they recognize that I am a leader on these issues, and that I will continue to do that and won't hold back in the office of Lieutenant Governor. I've successfully tackled very big issues, as I mentioned earlier, from marriage equality, end of life choices, cannabis, and others, and tackled a lot of climate work. And in my day-to-day -day work as a farmer, I'm a regenerative ag farmer. I've worked collaboratively with tens of thousands of Vermonters through my newsletter and networks, and will continue to do that to bring more people into the process. Thank you. Katie. Thank you. When I think about hope, um, I think about a younger generation, and I have two young daughters in their 20s, and they are still hopeful, even amid all of this chaos and confusion in this world. They, they have not given up on democracy yet, but they know there's a fight ahead of them. And, and I see within Molly, who's working on my campaign, she's 22 years old, she has a hopeful future, but she knows it's going to take work. We need to lead the way, but we also need to give room and to really bolster and, and bring the next generation along and to listen to them. For my closing statement, I, I would say, I have a great care for the state of Vermont, and I know it's up to every one of us to leave this state and leave this world better than we found it, because if we don't, we're not doing our job, and, and that's truly what I want to do. During my time in Montpelier, as of the time that I was chair of the House Appropriations Committee, we had to make very difficult decisions prior to all these federal dollars coming in. We always had more expenses than we had uh, revenues to pay for them, and they were difficult decisions. But in 2020, we balanced a $7.1 billion budget, and we provided many services to, to Vermonters who were struggling with the, with the COVID pandemic. And that is the work that I would like to continue to do. I would like to bring some purpose and some real meaning to the office of Lieutenant Governor. Use it as an office that is open to Vermonters to come in and to truly work on policy. Thank you. Well, so I, I actually agree with Kitty. I, I find hope in the next generation and it's why I'm running. I'm running to represent the next generation and I too think that it's time to allow the next generation to step up and step in and have a role like the Office of Lieutenant Governor, as for a very long time the same voices have been holding the same positions of power in Montpelier. We have reached a pivotal moment in our state's history. Wages are stagnant, families can't afford to live here, and they cannot afford to have their children here either, and women's rights are under threat. And we cannot solely rely on the past for solutions. Now is the time for the new era of leadership Will, that will modernize and build upon the good work and accomplishments of previous generations of Vermont legislators. As a leader of a statewide organization, I am in a unique position to deliver those results and incorporate the voices of all Vermonters. And I am hopeful, and I am running because I believe in the promise of Vermont truly and deeply from the bottom of my heart. And I know that together we will make childcare and housing affordable and build a green economy and strengthen our rural communities like Orange County that I love so much. We are in the midst of a sea change in Vermont politics. An unprecedented number of legislators are retiring this election cycle, making way for new faces and fresh ideas. The Lieutenant Governor's office should reflect that change. We need leadership that moves our state forward and builds a future that belongs to everyone. So I'm asking you to join our campaign today and help fulfill the promise of Vermont by visiting patriciaforvermont.com and getting involved in democracy today. Thank you.